Nauvoo Temple Bells by Shannon M. Tracy, Glenn M. Leonard, and Ronald G. Watt. The bell that hung briefly in the first Nauvoo Temple was removed when the saints left and was carried to winter quarters and then on to Utah. However, that bell cracked during the harsh winter of 1849 to 1850, and the Nauvoo Bell that now hangs in Temple Square is not that bell, but one purchased from a church in Iowa City. In this article, Tracy, Leonard, and Watt trace the history of both bells by looking at foundry records, steamship bells, journals, newspapers, and the Temple Square bell itself. The following is an excerpt of a chapter of the same name from the forthcoming book, Artifacts Speak, Revisiting Old Stories About Treasured Mormon Heirlooms, edited by Glenn M. Leonard, to be published by BYU Studies. June 27th, 2002, Nauvoo, Illinois, 6 o'clock p.m., Six long chimes ring from a bell located within the Nauvoo Temple Tower to signal the first of many dedicatory services for the newly rebuilt Nauvoo Temple. The sound seems to announce a rebirth of dreams long wanting to be fulfilled. Now, for the first time in over a century and a half, a bell rings in the dedicated House of the Lord that sits atop the bluff, overlooking the neatly planned streets of the lower city. As was its predecessor, this temple was built for the perfecting of the saints in the household of faith. It was erected to help establish the knowledge of eternity. It was fashioned to house revelations for its patrons concerning what steps they should take toward eternal life, what knowledge they should gain, and what covenants they should make. The bell heralds a renewed temple of the Lord. But this is not just any temple. This is the temple in the city of Joseph, the city beautiful. Nauvoo, Illinois was a place of hoped-for rest and peace. It was a center for the stakes of Zion, a place where weary saints gathered to find safety from a world that did not accept them. Nauvoo citizens had struggled to forge a community from a soggy bottom land into a Jeffersonian-style city. They charted out its coordinates along compass points as true and square as the doctrines that they espoused. But the saints would not be able to enjoy their beautiful city for long. In less than seven years after Nauvoo's establishment, its founder and mayor would be martyred and its citizens would be expelled from the city they had built. They found buyers for the better homes and farms at drastically reduced prices, but abandoned the rest, along with barns, land, and personal possessions. They would flee across the Mississippi River with barely enough to survive and the hope of a safe home far away in the West, and they would take with them their temple bell. For everything that the saints of Zion gave up when they left Nauvoo, the bell and Brigham Young's promise to replace the building in whose tower it hung, served in part to represent their hopes for the future. The bell also became an anchor, a remembrance of things past and a symbol of dreams yet to come. This chapter will recount the histories of the old Nauvoo temple bells. Yes, two bells bore that name, and examine the various stories of the original bell and its substitute with their colorful heritage. The First Nauvoo Temple Bell When the prophet Joseph Smith announced plans to build a temple in Nauvoo, he made it clear that the Lord said it was to be built by the sacrifices of the saints. This was not a casual statement. Many of the people of Nauvoo had recently escaped Missouri and had lost everything. Now they were required to build a house to the Lord where the covenants and ordinances of perfection could be administered. A tenth of all they possessed was to be given to begin the construction process, and then they were to donate a tenth of their increase and their time for the temple's completion. 
Financial aspects of this tithing apply to the entire church, not just Nauvoo citizens. After construction was underway, it was decided to hang a bell in a tower atop the temple. Martha Jane Knowlton reported Joseph Smith's explanation in an 1843 discourse. The prophet said, We will build upon the top of this temple a great observatory, a great and high watchtower, and in the top thereof we will suspend a tremendous bell that when it is rung shall rouse the inhabitants of Madison, wake up the people of Warsaw, and sound in the ears of men in Carthage. The idea of a temple bell was not new. The Kirtland Temple plans called for a bell that never materialized. In January 1836, William W. Phelps wrote to his wife, Sally Phelps, a great effort is now about to be made to procure a bell for the Lord's house. Similar intentions are found in plans for an earlier temple in a central block of the plat of the city of Zion in Jackson County, Missouri. In a letter dated June 25, 1833, Joseph Smith wrote, A belfry is to be in the east end and a bell of very large size. The Nauvoo Temple would become the first and, to date, the last house of the Lord with a bell in its steeple. In the late spring of 1845, nearly a year after Joseph's death, the governing quorum of the Twelve Apostles asked English members to consider contributing something substantial toward the construction of the temple. The request, signed by Brigham Young as quorum president and directed to British Mission President Wilford Woodruff, was to provide a bell for the temple. In their letter of May 8, 1845, the Twelve wrote, We have thought it might be very agreeable to the feelings of the English saints to furnish a bell for the temple. If this is their pleasure, you can forward it at the first conveyance, and we will have it hung as the building is going up. We are but little acquainted with the weight of bells. We have thought of 2,000 pounds weight, but we will leave this to your judgment. We want one that can be heard night or day. Woodruff published the Council's letter in the Mission's monthly magazine, the Latter-day Saints Millennial Star, and urged the members to respond to his call. Here was a clear way for the saints living abroad to assist in Joseph Smith's call to build a temple. In August 1845, an editorial in the Star stated that all further donations from the British saints would be used to obtain the bell and also a clock for the Nauvoo Temple. Woodruff instructed branch leaders to send their contributions directly to him. When contributions for the bell lagged, he announced in September that he would no longer distinguish between contributions for the temple and for the temple bell. We shall make use of all funds collected for the temple to pay for the bell until a sufficiency is procured. Meanwhile, in mid-September, a group of Hancock County, Illinois residents who wanted to rid the region of Latter-day Saints launched a campaign of harassment and arson that forced the Latter-day Saint farmers to abandon their properties and move into Nauvoo. Sometime later, Brigham Young informed Woodruff of a change in plans. Woodruff should now forward the money collected for the bell to Nauvoo. Apparently, Young heard nothing back from Woodruff, so in December, Young repeated the request with a new sense of urgency. I wrote you in my last letter that we intended to purchase the bell in this country, and desired you to transmit the money collected for that purpose by the first safe opportunity. I feel as ever anxious this should be done. During the week before Young sent his reminder notice, he dedicated the attic story and began the ordinance work for Nauvoo's Latter-day Saints. Wagon shops were at work preparing for the removal of thousands of people. 
Why import a large bell from England, or even purchase one stateside, for a building that would be left behind six months later? Would a smaller bell serve the temporary needs? One can only remember the commitment of the saints to complete the edifice as commanded by the Lord, that you may prove yourselves unto me, that ye are faithful in all things whatsoever I command you, that I may bless you and crown you with honor, immortality, and eternal life. In January 1846, as Wilfred Woodruff was making plans to leave Great Britain, he informed the British members that some 220 pounds has been donated since we called for assistance for the bell and clock. He encouraged the saints to continue their efforts in collecting funds for the bell. Donations for the temple received by Woodruff and Reuben Headlock, who succeeded Woodruff as president of the British mission, stood at just over £535 in Woodruff's final published accounting before he left England. Woodruff set aside the original directive to purchase an English bell and one of four clocks planned for the temple tower. Instead, he forwarded the funds to church headquarters. He sent the bulk of the donations to the temple committee in Nauvoo by an unnamed courier and carried a very small balance, eight pounds, 13 shillings, five and a half pence, with him across the Atlantic to New York and then to Nauvoo. His actions fulfilled Young's request to transmit the money by the first safe opportunity. It was just as well. A bell was secured and put to use in Nauvoo before Woodruff sailed from Liverpool in February 1846. If Woodruff had purchased an English bell, it could not have arrived in Nauvoo prior to mid-April 1846. That is when Woodruff's journal records his reunion with his wife, Phoebe, and their children. Heber C. Kimball's journal says that each session of the temple endowment was announced with the ringing of the temple bell while endowments were being administered. Between December 10th, 1845, and February 7th, 1846, the image is a poignant one. For years, the saints had toiled to build their temple in the midst of poverty. Now, with joyous hearts, they could hear the beautiful sounds of a bell calling them to the house of the Lord to receive their washings, anointings, and endowments. Of all the tasks this bell would be called on to perform, this would be the finest and remain longest in the hearts of the people, a call to come out from the world and to prepare for eternity. Kimball's journal account is consistent with the idea of a locally acquired bell. In contrast, many of the traditional stories have a bell from England arriving with Wilford Woodruff. One of those is a reminiscence of George Washington Bean, who worked on the Nauvoo Temple as a young man. Bean told his son, Willard W. Bean, that he had been present at the temple's dedication. George would have been 15 at the time. Willard Bean is quoted in one source as saying, among other things, he, George W. Bean, spoke of a large bell some of the brethren, missionaries, had sent from England by ship to New Orleans, thence by river steamer up the Mississippi River to Nauvoo, where it was hung with some difficulty in the steeple of the temple. While this part of George Bean's recollection lacks veracity, his description of the bell's later use in the Salt Lake Fort can be verified. George Bean was not the only one who knew half the story. Wilford Woodruff's request for donations was widely known, but fewer people knew of Brigham Young's decision to use an American bell. That decision was communicated by letter and not widely known to the public. The stories of an English bell hanging in the Nauvoo Temple have been passed down from one generation to another, often converging with other stories. They include unreliable personal recollections mingled with verifiable documented facts. 
the traditional story became an assumed truth that found its way unchallenged into reputable publications. Aside from the English Bell stories, early Latter-day Saint sources offer no explanation of the Bell's origin, acquisition, or size. Bells of that time varied widely in size. The projected 2,000-pound British Bell would fit the large category. If a temporary bell of medium proportions was chosen, it might have weighed between 300 and 800 pounds and measured up to 33 inches in diameter. The bronze alloy bell hung in the rebuilt Nauvoo Temple weighs 846 pounds and has a diameter of 33 and a half inches. It was produced by the Verdon Clock and Bell Company, with headquarters in Cincinnati, Ohio, and cast at the Petit Fritzen Bell Foundry in the Netherlands. Another choice might have been as small as a steamboat signal bell, the type reported by Thomas L. Kane in 1846. Usually much smaller, a steamboat bell's diameter could reach up to 33 inches. Whatever its size, by the fall of 1845, a signal bell was in use, both before and after it was placed atop the temple. The Nauvoo Temple Bell served as one of three, perhaps four, distinct signaling devices used to alert the people of Nauvoo. Some of these alarms could be used at ground level, others required an elevated position, ultimately the roof or tower of the temple. As safety concerns increased in late summer, work on the Temple Tower moved forward. On Saturday, August 23, 1845, the cupola, or dome, was raised to the top of the Temple Tower, with Stephen Goddard writing it up. According to Willard Richards, Goddard further demonstrated his agility when he stood on his head on the top of the spire post. Following this feat, 60 or 70 workmen celebrated by eating watermelons in the attic. The men then hoisted a flag, which remained in place until Sunday night. Once the dome was in place, a bell could be hung in the tower. The date of its hanging is not known. On November 20th, 1845, a newspaper in Burlington, Iowa, across the river from Nauvoo, noted that the saints are finishing the temple, putting in the carpets, etc., and intend to hang a bell. If accurate, this report would allow a bell situated temporarily on the ground to be used in sounding military alarms in September, and the same bell, or a larger one, to be hung in the tower before ordinance work began. The alarms sounded in mid-September are described by Nauvoo residents as coming from the Nauvoo Temple Bell. The reports do not say if it was a land-based bell or one in the tower. On September 10th, vigilantes attacked Morley Settlement. This was the beginning of a campaign to torch Latter-day Saint farm buildings and grain stacks in rural Hancock County in an effort to drive the Latter-day Saints out of Illinois. In response, Nauvoo officials stepped up preparations to defend the city. On September 17th, they gathered the men and posted small detachments at key entry routes outside Nauvoo and within the city. Colonel Jonathan Hale, for example, was ordered to station 30 men from his 3rd Regiment in the Squire Spencer Barn, east of the Temple. The first known mention of a signal bell associated with the Temple was recorded at the September 17th gathering. Nauvoo's police chief, Hosea Stout, who was managing militia assignments for Major General Charles C. Rich, ordered that at the tolling of the Temple bell, Every man know it as an alarm and repair forthwith armed and equipped to the parade ground. The next day, Stout mentioned a second way to alert the citizen soldiers. All companies of the Nauvoo Legion 
were to be in readiness for actual service at a moment's warning, and that they immediately repair to the ground they now occupied. At firing of the artillery, it shall be the signal of alarm. A test of his signal on the 19th brought the soldiers together from meeting with Brigham Young. At the meeting, Brigham Young identified other ways to notify the militia. Hosea Stout reported Young's message. As signals, we will have the flag hoisted and then let all men be on the ground as a flag with stripes is hoisted. It is a signal for all commissioned officers to meet in council at General George Miller's house. Young added, We intend shortly to have a light at night on the top of the temple which can be seen for miles. The light would be a way to alert more distant volunteers. A striped flag would call the officers to the parade ground, and a white flag would invite the men to muster. From her home in Nauvoo, Zena Diantha Huntington Jacobs could see the white flag, a signature to gather. She also heard the firing of the cannon that week and understood its meaning. When rumors that a mob was gathering at Carthage reached Nauvoo on September 21st, the flag was raised and the temple bell rang to collect a posse to go to Carthage. Between 40 to 50 men responded to the bell's alarm. They left Nauvoo under Colonel Stephen Markham's command. As more troops were being marshaled, Lieutenant General Brigham Young arrived on the scene. The alarm was false, he said, and he dismissed the troops. The attacks on outlying Latter-day Saint properties in the fall of 1845 led the Twelve to confirm a private decision made in March. They would sell church properties, including the temple, and move the Latter-day Saints to a new gathering place in the West. Before the mass exodus, Brigham Young dedicated parts of the temple in phases to allow sacred ordinances to be performed. On the 5th of October, Young offered a dedicatory prayer and presented the temple, thus far completed, to the Lord as a monument of the saints' liberality, fidelity, and faith. Throughout the fall and winter of 1845, church leaders pursued opportunities to sell or lease the temple. In October, they extended an invitation to Catholic Bishop Purcell of Cincinnati. A month later, they advertised in the Burlington Hawkeye an offer to rent the temple to any responsible society. In December, Brigham Young received a tip that a firm in Philadelphia was interested in buying the temple, but nothing came of it. Brigham Young wanted to see a finished temple before he left with a pioneer company, but threats against his freedom hastened the departure of the church's leaders, those who were administering the ordinances. On January 2, 1846, Young reassured the saints that leaving Nauvoo did not mean the end of temple ordinances. We can't stay in this house but a little while, he said, we have got to build another house. It will be a larger house than this and a more glorious one, and we shall build a great many houses and build houses all over the continent of North America. The next phase for the temple was its closing down. February 7, 1846 marked the last endowments and the last proxy baptisms for the dead. The next day, a Sunday, Young met with the Council of the Twelve in his office in the southeast corner of the temple attic. It was in this room that couples knelt across an altar to be married. We knelt around the altar, Young noted in his journal, and dedicated the building to the Most High. We asked his blessing upon our intended move to the West, also asked him to enable us some day to finish the temple, and dedicate it to him, and to preserve the building as a monument to Joseph Smith. We then left the temple. When Brigham Young left the temple on the 8th, 
He told a congregation in the grove that the twelve would depart later that week. Everyone else was to follow when the prairie lands of Iowa had dried and grasses were growing. Some anxious families left ahead of schedule, less than a fourth of the whole. Most of the exiles crossed the river systematically as planned, from March through the end of May. In late March, Orson Hyde wrote to Brigham Young, who was camped at Sugar Creek, Iowa, that the temple would not be ready for its planned dedication on April 6, 1846, the church's 16th anniversary. Instead, dedicatory services began with a private dedication on April 30th with Wilford Woodruff as voice, followed by a public meeting on May 1st when Joseph Young offered a dedicatory prayer. Woodruff arrived in Nauvoo from England two weeks before the dedication. On April 13, 1846, from a steamboat still some distance downriver, he caught his first glance of Nauvoo. Raising a spyglass to his eye to get a better view, he examined the city and found that the temple truly looked splendid. Later Uses of the Nauvoo Temple Bell References to the ringing of the bell continued after the dedication of the Nauvoo Temple. On June 14, 1846, Nauvoo's militia heard the ringing of the temple bell. Around 700 armed men gathered on the green behind the temple with their firearms. A large mob had assembled at nearby Golden Point, threatening to attack the temple. On this occasion, the mob dispersed, but these renewed threats prompted many families to hasten their efforts to leave and join those already on their way. Over the next several weeks, the temple bell was regularly used to sound an alarm for men to assemble in defense of the city. George Morris, who remained behind in Nauvoo to help complete the temple, remembered those days. I have lain in the temple night after night upon the hard wooden benches with my rifle by my side, expecting an attack every minute. I have laid in my bed with my clothes on and my gun leaning against my pillow where I could lay my hand upon it, and jumped from my bed at all hours of the night, at the sound of the big drum and the ringing of the temple bell, which was a signal for us to gather. As Morris noted, it was not just a bell hanging in the temple tower belfry that alerted the troops. A bass drum was there also. On September 10th, at the beginning of what would be known as the Battle of Nauvoo, the bell rang to notify a mixture of Latter-day Saint forces and newly arrived non-Latter-day Saint city residents of the coming battle. The two competing militaries exchanged shots that day, and again on the 11th, we soon got into order, Curtis E. Bolton wrote in his diary, and just as the bell was rung to give notice that the mob were in motion, we started to meet them. On the 16th, following the battle, the trustees surrendered the city to the mob by signaling a treaty. The agreement allowed the trustees and two others to remain in Nauvoo for the disposition of church and private property. All other Latter-day Saints were required to move out as soon as possible. The next day, invaders occupied Nauvoo and began to forcibly remove the remnant followers of Brigham Young from the city. The trustees were forced under duress to give the keys of the temple to Henry I. Young, chairman of the Quincy Committee, who promptly opened the building to the invaders. Desecration of the temple began immediately. On the 18th, some of the invaders climbed up the tower, where they beat the drum, rang the bell, and shouted for joy. One preacher yelled, Peace, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth. Now the Mormons are driven. Around this time, Colonel Thomas L. Kane a friend to the Latter-day Saints, visited Nauvoo. He found the temple in the possession of a drunken mob. 
He convinced the guards that he was just an interested passerby, and they permitted him to view the interior. Colonel Kane climbed to the observation section of the tower and viewed the city from there. In the steeple, he found fragments of food, cruises of liquor, and broken drinking vessels, along with a bass drum and a steamboat signal bell. The bell, he said, was located in the high belfry. A cruel spirit of insulting frolic carried some of them up into the high belfry of the temple steeple, and there, with wicked childishness of inebriates, they whooped and shrieked and beat the drum that I had seen, and rang in cherivoric unison their loud-tongued steamboat bell. Kane's description of the bell as a steamboat signal bell added more complexity to the Nauvoo Bell's history. Typically, a steamboat bell would have been smaller than a good-sized church bell. Steamboat bells, like some bells used in churches, were of non-rocker type and were rung with the use of a clapper. Rocking-type bells were not standard on boats because they were prone to ring with the wave movement of the ship. Steamboat bells ranged from 14 to 33 inches in circumference, depending on the size and design of the boat. Kane did not offer dimensions in his description of the bell, yet his eyewitness account of the drum and a steamboat signal bell in the tower does suggest that this bell was the same one used by the saints. Kane's observation is trustworthy evidence of the bell's style and type and a hint as to its origin. The Nauvoo Temple Bell Goes West Westward bound, Daniel H. Wells and William Cutler arrived at winter quarters on September 23, 1846. They carried letters for Brigham Young reporting the events surrounding the Battle of Nauvoo. His directions concerning church property included this directive, As you will have no further use for the temple bell, we wish you to forward it to us by the first possible chance, for we have much need of it at this place. Acting on these instructions, the trustees saw to it that the bell was removed from the temple and transported to the Missouri River Camp of the Saints. Joshua Hawks stated in 1904 that he and James Houghton took the Nauvoo Temple Bell over the Mississippi River in October 1846, and that it was in the charge of Joseph L. Haywood. Haywood was one of the trustees. The bell arrived in winter quarters by December 1846, and was placed in the public square, where its chiming called people to worship services and community meetings. For example, on the 20th, after Mary Richards had taken care of her morning chores, she sat down to write a letter. In about ten minutes afterward, the temple bell rung for meeting, got ready, and went. Brother Brigham preached a sermon that I think will be long remembered by all who heard it. In his unforgettable remarks, Young called on the people to cease their swearing, stealing, evil speaking, and other vices, or they would suffer God's punishment. The bell was still in use in the public square in winter quarters the following spring as the Vanguard Pioneer Company prepared for their departure. John D. Lee noted that on Sunday, March 21st, the saints assembled in a special conference at the stand by request of President Brigham Young, notified or by the signal of the ringing of the temple bell. Five days later, on a Friday, Norton Jacob wrote in his journal, At ten o'clock, the people were called together by the ringing of the old temple bell, and a special conference was held preparatory to the departure of the pioneers. Brother Brigham chastened the people severely for being so covetous and withholding their means in fitting out the pioneers. Before Brigham Young left winter quarters in April 1847, he signed an epistle from the Twelve, 
containing detailed instructions for those who would follow. The letter directed Charles C. Rich to bring the bell to Utah in his emigrant company. The first company will carry the temple bell with fixtures for hanging at a moment's notice, which will be rung at daylight or a proper time and call all who are able to arise to prayers, after which ringing of bell and breakfast or ringing of bell and departure in 15 minutes to secure the cool of the day till breakfast time, etc., as the bell may be needed, particularly in the night season if Indians are hovering around to let them know you are at your duty. Contrary to the plan, Rich's emigrant company was not the first to leave after President Young's departure. Instead, four companies left winter quarters between June 17th and 19th, and Rich's left June 21st, after waiting two weeks for a cannon. We are organized to move five abreast the two cannon skiff and Temple Bell heading the middle line, Patty Sessions wrote in her diary. Rich attached the bell to a wagon where it could be easily rung to wake the company each day, signal them to begin their day's journey, and warn off potential Indian attacks. In her autobiography, Sarah Rich Charles C.'s wife, described the arrangement. There was also a skiff, or a boat, fitted up on wheels, and the cannon placed on that. So the boat, and one cannon, and the big bell was in our company. The bell was so arranged over the boat and cannon that it could be rung by pulling a rope. Notice that the big bell was sounded with the pull of a rope attached to the clapper, the way steamboat bells were rung. Because of the combined weight of the bell, cannon, and boat, two yoke of oxen were required to pull this custom wagon over the trail to Utah. By June 21, 1847, Rich's company was on its way to the Great Salt Lake Valley. Along the route west, Rich journalized, We rang the bell at daylight for getting up and putting out our herds. Rang again at 8 o'clock for starting. The Nauvoo Temple Bell arrived safely in the Salt Lake Valley in mid-September. On October 2nd, it was placed in the original 10-acre log and adobe fort, next to the flagpole and not far from the brush bowery built by the returning members of the Mormon Battalion. Three weeks later, Tarleton Lewis paid one dollar to install a bell post and hang the bell. A time or two, that first winter, the bell post was used as a whipping post to punish thieves who chose a bare-backed whipping over a $10 fine. Later on, the Nauvoo Bell was moved to a new location near the old Bowery on Temple Square, where it peeled forth its silvery notes to call the saints to religious services. As a signal bell, it also launched other community functions including organized wolf hunts. Unlike the first year's gathering, the Pioneer Day observance of July 24, 1849, made use of the artillery brought by Charles C. Rich's company and the Nauvoo Bell. The event began early with the firing of one cannon. A brass band traveled throughout the city in two carriages playing martial airs. After a large national flag was unfurled atop a hundred-foot-tall liberty pole, it was saluted with the firing of six guns. Next came the ringing of the Nauvoo Bell, followed by spirit-stirring airs from the band. As a procession moved from Brigham Young's home to the Bowery for a formal celebration, the young men and young ladies sang a hymn through the street, The cannons kept up one continual roar. The musketry rolled, the Nauvoo bell pealed out its silvery notes, and the brass band played a slow march. Truly, the saints and their leaders felt the need to celebrate in grand style their arrival in a new gathering place. The Nauvoo bell occupied a place of prominence in this celebration. 
but in subsequent celebrations of July 24th, the bell was absent. It had met an unfortunate death. During the severe winter of 1849 to 1850, the bell cracked during a hard frost, making it unusable. A proposal to repair it by welding was abandoned when no one could be found locally with the needed skill. Later, the Deseret News reported that it is about being recast and enlarged, and we hope to hear its cheering tones again in a few days. It is a heavy undertaking for our present means, but it is confidently believed that the iron furnace left by the gold diggers last season, when attached to the flue of the mint, can accomplish the object. It is unlikely that the materials, equipment, and skills to cast and enlarge the bell existed in Utah in 1850. We talked with a specialist at the Verdin Bell Company, the firm that provided a bell for the rebuilt Nauvoo Temple. First of all, our contact said the mixing of bronze, a copper-based alloy, with other metals, often tin, must be carefully balanced in their proportions. Second, because a substantial amount of superfluous metal burns off during the smelting and casting processes, bell foundries do not reuse the material from older bells. Finally, it would be next to impossible to determine the mixture of metals in the Nauvoo bell in order to match it. Any attempt to blend metals, the Verdon expert said, would create a brittle bell without true tones. Indeed, the Utah craftsmen acknowledged that they faced a heavy undertaking for their present means. David Shait, an expert at the Smithsonian, offered a similar assessment. He doubted that craftsmen inexperienced with bell making could produce a fine-tuned bell with the 49ers furnace. In addition, he said that to create a new bell, they would need another bell to serve as a pattern. The Deseret News said nothing more about the experiment to create a new bell in the iron furnace. If the cracked original Nauvoo bell was destroyed in a failed attempt to recast an enlarged version, as we believe, what is that large bell hanging in the handsome 35-foot campanile on Temple Square? The short answer? The bell on Temple Square, known publicly for decades as the Nauvoo Bell, is a 19th century church bell named for the minister whose Midwestern church it once briefly adorned. The Hummer Bell The story of Michael Hummer's bell begins in 1840, when he arrived in Iowa City. He had chosen the ministry and prepared himself with training in college and Presbyterian Seminary. Hummer was born in 1800 in Kentucky. At age 20, he signed a covenant, renouncing Christianity. He decided to give himself to money-making. Later, a religious leader reached out to this infidel, and Hummer was converted. It was then that he received his college and seminary training and became a minister. During the 1838 school year, Hummer taught in an academy in Stevenson, now Rock Island City, Illinois. The following spring, he was engaged by the Presbyterian Church in Davenport, Iowa for six months of preaching. A member of the Davenport congregation remembered Hummer's distinct personality. He was a very talented man and was considered for years the ablest clergyman in the state, but he was very peculiar. He possessed a high temper and did not hesitate to show it if occasion required. A contemporary characterized him as a man of vigorous intellect and an orator, but of ungovernable temper. It was said that he entered upon his work with confidence and energy, the Schuyler Presbyter of Illinois sent Hummer to Iowa City to consecrate a small congregation, that is, to increase their level of their devotion to sacred things. Hummer arrived in Iowa City with the Reverend Lancelot Graham Bell, 
the founder of numerous Presbyterian churches in developing areas west of the Mississippi. Iowa City was a little more than a year old. Streets had been opened and lots cleared of timber. The inhabitants had erected frame, log, and clapboard houses and had finished one story of the Capitol when the two churchmen arrived. Working together in September 1840, they organized the First Presbyterian Church of Iowa City. Thirteen members made up the original congregation. For the next two years, four ministers in succession served the congregation for a short time each. In December 1842, Michael Hummer was given greater authority and an opportunity for significant leadership in an expanded organization. The Reverends S.J. Bill and M. Hummer were elected as presiding ministers. Hummer was given the additional role of present pastor. The newly staffed board of trustees consisted of a lead miner, two farmers, three merchants, and a carpenter. These men drafted a new constitution to guide the church. With a constitution in place, the trustees could receive real estate, build a building, and conduct other secular business. In the spring of 1843, the board gave Hummer the responsibility to raise funds for a church building. The following November, a subscription paper circulated. Trustee Chauncey Swan headed the list by donating $300 and a building lot valued at $100. The lot at Clinton and Market Streets was elevated and a block north of what succeeding generations would call the Old Capitol. Solicitation extended out to other congregations as well. To generate support, the trustees promised in point of size, taste, and durability, the church should be inferior to no church than being finished in Iowa City. Donations varied in size, from Swan's generous offer to what for many was a generous five dollars. Forty-seven people promised contributions, totaling nine hundred dollars. The early years in Iowa City were, as one historian put it, the years when the men and women of Iowa had to blend their energies to meet the necessity of a roof over their heads and a supply of bacon and meal for their table. The board sent Hummer East to raise money from older and richer Presbyterian congregations. The Iowa City trustees agreed to reimburse Hummer for his expenses. His salary would be 10% of the money he raised. Hummer headed out in the spring of 1844, the first of two or three trips east during the following two and a half years. Hummer's ledger for 1845 to 1847 itemizes expenses for materials and services. He purchased a bell from the Manili Bell Foundry in Troy, New York, and in 1847 collected from donors in Virginia, Pennsylvania, and New York just over $600. Before Hummer left Iowa, the trustees hired a contractor to build the church. While in New York, Hummer received two letters from Theodore Sanksky, raising concerns about the contractor. The trustees had approved a $5,500 contract for the building, an ambitious undertaking. Sanksky said the contractor put up the walls and got the window frames and rafters in place, but seemed unwilling to do much more. Church donors were upset. The contractor wanted extra pay for minor items needed for the building, but not specified in the contract. His only cry is money, money, money. Hummer suggested that people donate a few locks, pew fasteners, and butts. In July 1845, the trustees accepted Hummer's suggestion and named him an agent to settle with the contractor and to superintend future operations. Hummer turned his energy to the project. He provided architectural drawings and wrote out specifics on dimensions, lumber, carpenter work, 
painting and brickwork for the spire. In late December 1846, Hummer delivered his first sermon in a basement meeting room in the unfinished church. The completed church building was dedicated on February 24, 1850, two years after S.H. Hazard replaced Hummer as minister. As the trustees promised, the church was not of inferior quality. The classic brick building measured 42 feet across and extended 75 feet from front to back. It featured a high portico and Grecian columns and cupola. The society had expended around $5,000. A smaller-than-desired bell sounded the call to services. For many parishioners, a church bell was seen as a mark of success. Doctrinal issues and financial conflict ended Hummer's service in 1848. During his trips east, he embraced some of the beliefs and activities attributed to Emanuel Swedenborg, among them a form of spirit rapping or spiritualism. Such ideas, considered unorthodox by Presbyterians, were not well received by most of Hummer's congregation. In addition, Hummer was said to be always excitable, somewhat peculiar, and an avowed infidel before his conversion. As a youth, Hummer was an atheist who converted to Presbyterianism. The congregation's challenges against Hummer's unacceptable preaching were not the only controversies. Soon they charged him with misconduct in his handling of the funds. The matter was complicated because he paid his own salary and expenses out of the donated funds, and he did not reveal the details. During a subsequent trial to investigate these matters, Hummer became furious and left the room in a rage. The presbytery, he declared, is a den of ecclesiastical thieves. Despite the rift, Hummer tried to remain in his position, but because he ignored the authority of the presbytery and its finding he was not successful. At the first session of the elders in 1848, Michael Hummer was formally expelled from the ministry by the church trustees and set adrift. Before Hummer left Iowa City, he reached an agreement with the church trustees. As partial payment of the salary still owed to him, the two parties mutually agreed that he could take possession of the communion service, two Bibles, the pulpit furniture, twelve lamps, and other movable property of the church. In addition, he would also receive a promissory note for $658.22, which was secured by a mortgage on the church real estate. He was to receive annual installments of $100 each. After settling with the church, Hummer moved south to Keokuk. His plan was to create a spiritualistic temple or church to promote his ideas of Swedenborgianism. A specialist in Presbyterian history observed, whatever his faults might be, Hummer was by no means a commonplace man. He came to be recognized as an able, original, striking, and to some extent, effective preacher. And strangers stopping in Iowa City, it is said, were apt to go hear him. Excitable and visionary at all times, he at length showed such violence that his parishioners believed him insane. Hummer continued his involvement in the ministry after he left Iowa City. His last years were focused on an unnamed kind of business, presumably making money. Hummer knew that the Iowa City Church operated with limited funds. The Board of Trustees had agreed to his removal of physical property. The Board would later challenge that assumption. Did the bell also belong to him? Late in the summer of 1848, Hummer returned to Iowa City, accompanied by James W. Margrave, a former trustee who supported Hummer's plans to create a new movement in Keokuk. 
Their plan was for Hummer to climb into the belfry, unfasten the bell, and, with ropes and tackle, slowly lower the bell to the ground. Margrave would be waiting with a wagon, readied for a hasty retreat with the prize. Their intent? Transport the bell to Keokuk and place it in the belfry of Hummer's new church. As the men were getting their equipment in place, curious onlookers in the small city gathered to see what was happening. The two conspirators apparently did not anticipate such interest, and they were not prepared for any resistance. Hummer climbed the tall construction ladder and successfully lowered the bell to the ground. But while he was still in the belfry, unfastening the block and tackle, Margrave left the bell unattended. He took off to fetch his team and wagon from a nearby stable. During Margrave's absence, six or eight of the spectators implemented their own plan. First, they removed the ladder, trapping the now irritated Hummer in the empty belfry. Next, they loaded the bell into Eli Meyer's wagon and drove away. According to reminiscent accounts in Iowa City, the stranded Hummer began raving and scolding and gesticulating like a madman, while the boys and other bystanders laughed at his helpless wrath. Hummer launched into an impromptu sermon, described by witnesses as more remarkable for its emphatic language than for logic of thought, and then proceeded to drive home his points by hurling toward the crowd below pieces of scantling, bricks, and other loose boards from the unfinished bell tower. When Margrave returned, he freed his leader, but the bell was long gone. The pair headed back to Keokuk, without the desired goal in tow. The Iowa City men who had taken the bell from Hummer transported it up the Iowa River to a point near the mouth of Rapid Creek. There, they sank it in deep water for a temporary hiding place. To aid in a later retrieval, they attached one end of a large chain to the bell and the other end to the trunk of an elm tree near the bank. It is said that these secondary thieves intended to keep the bell secured, while waiting for a settlement of the difficulties between the ex-minister and the trustees. However, when a few of the men returned to retrieve the bell, all they found was a chain still attached to the tree. The bell at the other end was gone. Some surmised that the bell had washed down the river or even sunk through to China. Meantime, Hummer employed his own approach. Drawing on his newfound beliefs, Hummer engaged in spirit rappings. He was told through the spirits, Hummer said, that the bell was buried in a well located eight miles to the west. Hummer and Margrave failed to locate the missing bell. The removal of the Hummer bell was a topic of great interest at the time. A local historian said it was talked about, laughed over, and turned into a great deal of fun. Two young lawyers, John P. Cook and William H. Tuthill, wrote a song, improvising and expanding it as they sang. The first stanza of their creation, Hummer's Bell, reads as follows. Ah, Hummer's Bell, ah, Hummer's Bell, how many a tale of woe t'would tell, of Hummer driving up to town to take the brazen jewel down, and when high up in his belfry they moved the ladder, yes siree. Thus while he towered aloft, they say, the bell took wings and flew away. A panel cartoon reflecting the same point of view, sketched on brown paper not long after the bell's confiscation, was displayed in a local shop window and later published. While the Iowa writers and artists kept the general story alive, a detailed explanation of the Bell's travel to Utah and its uses there remained unwritten for years. Latter-day Saint emigrant company rosters, family recollections, newspaper reports, diaries, and correspondence between Brigham Young and various claimants reveal the rest of the story.
Most importantly, these sources explain how Hummer's large brass church bell became confused with a smaller Nauvoo temple bell. The Lamoro Brothers and the Hummer Bell The key Latter-day Saint player in this entanglement was David Burlock Lamoro. Though not a participant, David's older brother, Andrew Losi Lamoro, was implicated in some accounts. So who are these brothers? Andrew Lamoro was born at Pickering, York, Ontario, Canada, in 1812. His brother David was born at the same place in 1819. Their father, John McCord Lamoro, supported his family in Pickering as a successful grocery man for over 20 years. John had inherited the business from his father Joshua, who fled to Canada from his native state, New York, where he had been branded a Tory because of his loyalty to King George of England and his refusal to fight with the American patriots during the Revolutionary War. While in his early teens, David Lamoro was cutting down trees when a sapling hit him in the face and broke his nose completely off. David ran for help with the nose in his hands. Stitched back onto his face, the nose survived. The accident left a hole in his forehead, so for the rest of his life, David wore a patch to hide it. When John Taylor and Parley P. Pratt brought the message of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ to John Lamoro, he opened up the attic of his big store as an assembly room. The elders preached there to a room filled with the interested and the curious. The Lamoro family accepted the gospel message. To them, it was as if coming directly from heaven. All were soon baptized. The new Latter-day Saints sold their holdings and left Canada in 1838. John and his family, including Andrew and David, moved first to Kirtland, where they lived briefly, and next to Dayton, Ohio. In 1839, all of the family except Andrew moved to Springfield, Sangamon County, Illinois, into one of the few Latter-day Saint stakes created outside Nauvoo. Meanwhile, Andrew and his family moved to Missouri, from which they were soon expelled. They relocated to Nauvoo, and eventually the entire family joined them. The Lamoro family observed the rising stone walls of the temple and received their temple blessings. Andrew served as a captain of a company assigned to the fortifications in the Battle of Nauvoo in September 1846. The Lamoro family left Nauvoo in the Great Exodus of 1846 that, over a period of seven months, sent thousands of Latter-day Saints across the Mississippi River into Iowa. The Lamoros spent a year or so in the Canesville area, now Council Bluffs, Iowa, where they prepared for the trek to Utah. During that time, Father John Lamoro died. On June 21, 1847, the Nauvoo Temple Bell left winter quarters, attached to a wagon for use as a signal bell in the Charles C. Rich Emigrant Company of 126 Latter-day Saints. This party was the last of ten that crossed the plains that year. On July 3rd of the following year, Andrew, his wife, Isabel, and their four children left winter quarters in the Willard Richards Company. They reached their destination in mid-October, 1848. Meanwhile, David and Mary Ann Lamoro and their children relocated 95 miles north along the Mississippi River from Nauvoo in Iowa City. It was during his sojourn in Iowa City that David Lamoro became involved in the rescue of the Hummer's Bell. He was with those who hauled off the bell and sank it in Rapid Creek. The other named participants included Eli Myers, who drove the team, James Miller, and A.B. Newcomb. 
Over time, these four men concluded that the wrangling between Hummer and the church elders over ownership would not be resolved. This foursome, and possibly others, joined the rush to California for gold and took the bell with them. David Lamoro chose to travel only as far as Utah. All of the Lamoro's adventurous associates made it to California. Eli Myers, a 24-year-old farmer in rural agency Wapello country and a native of Ohio, left behind his wife, Elizabeth, and their three children, the youngest just nine months old. James Miller, 32, had migrated from his native Scotland to Canada, where he married and then, in 1846, relocated to Iowa. His California venture left his wife, Elizabeth, and sons, ages six and three, in Iowa. Connecticut-born A. B. Newcomb, 45, left his wife, H. A., and their daughter behind. However, at different times over the next few years, all three returned to Iowa and moved their families to the gold fields in Amador County, east of Sacramento, towards Sutter's Creek.